Hey everybody, Brian Zimmerman here, executive editor of Jazz Is Magazine and host of Jazz Is Live, coming to you on a Thursday afternoon. Now what we're gonna be doing in this episode is continuing with our Jazz Essentials series. Uh, and this is gonna be a really cool one. We've talked a little bit about this subject on our Facebook page, but we're gonna be exploring some essential instrumentalists who play what we're calling unconventional instruments in jazz, okay? So, you know, we gotta face it, jazz has a storied history, but it has its conventions, especially when it comes to instrumentation, right? We know some of the big instruments, piano, bass, saxophone, trumpet, um, you know, pretty much what we consider standard instruments in jazz. But throughout jazz's history, there have been amazing musicians, amazing players who have played musicians a little bit outside uh, the mainstream. So we're gonna be going through our five favorite favorite uh, musicians who play unconventional instruments on today's show. And as always, as we do this, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you can recommend an instrumentalist for us, uh, please do so in the comments. You heard me say us, and that is because we are going to be joined today by everyone's favorite co-host. That would be Jazz's online editor, Matt Micucci, joining us from Genoa, Italy. Uh, he is here, and he is going to help me walk us through these five uh, essential unconventional instrumentalists. So Matt Micucci, are you there, sir? People of the universe, how are you doing? <laughs> Hello to you. Thank you so much for joining us from, yeah. uh, you know, across the world there in Genoa, your birthplace. Right, my birthplace. I got to tell you, Brian, I'm so nervous right now. Not so much because of the topic. That's a fun topic. But because these connections have me so just <laughs> concerned all the time. I'm, I'm just stressed out right now. My heart is beating fast. Hopefully everything will go smoothly after oh, the last Oh, you time. know, it, it never does, Matt. But that is no. our specialty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Improvisation and doing it on the fly. And so before we get into this list, I have set some ground rules, you know, for us, which is that these instruments, you know, I wanted them to kind of be, well, we're going to alternate. Number one, I picked three, you picked two. And uh, I wanted these to kind of be uh, instruments that, uh, well, first of all, in my case, I wanted these to be primary instruments. So you pick mm -hmm. some, you know, some musicians who are, you know, they they play standard instruments, but uh, they work some unconventional instruments into their repertoire. I pick yes. some where the primary instrument, the instrument they made their living on was this unconventional instrument. Um, so we that those were my ground rules for myself. The hope here, Matt, is of course that, you know, these instruments will become conventional because in jazz, you know, there's really no such thing as unconventional. It's, it's diverse, it's about embracing everything. And so, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and kick off our list. And as we do, uh, I guess this is Haido Castro Mora saying hello from Costa Rica, hello to you. Uh, and yeah, if you wanna drop us a line, and again, let us know your favorite unconventional instrumentalist please do so in the comments. Uh, before we do that though, Matt, real quickly wanted to thank a sponsor that makes these episodes possible. That would be the DC Jazz Festival. Uh, this is festival is going on online, of course, as all of them are now. September 24th, it kicks off and it is going through the 28th. Uh, let me pull up the and here, yeah, this is the 16th annual DC Jazz Festival streaming live from our nation's capital Thursday, September 24th through September 28th, bringing world-class jazz programming to the global stage uh, for the very first time with over 20 performances from international superstars and homegrown talent alike. Uh, this year's festival, the theme is the real DC, DC homegrown talent. Uh, so join the festival for five days of performances, interviews, and other exclusive jazz content you can watch for free on Gather by Events DC or at fans.com or on the DC Jazz Festival Facebook page. And you can learn more at dcjazzfest.org. All right, with that, Matt, let's go ahead and kick off the list. I'm starting with number five. My unconventional instrumentalist of choice would be Mr. Julius Watkins playing jazz French horn. And I'm sure Jeff will bring up a picture soon. But uh, yeah, Julius is a remarkable musician. He's a French horn player originally from Michigan. Uh, you know, he got his start like most French horn players do in classical music. Uh, however, by 1955, 
he was recording leader albums uh, for Blue Note Records. He put out a phenomenal leader album on Blue Note Records. Um, and you got to remember, this was during the period, late 50s, early 60s, right, Matt, where kind of these big orchestral bands were the sound. I think Miles Davis, Porgy and Bess. Um, and, and Julius appeared on a lot of these albums. He was on Porgy and Bess. He was on Gil Evans, The Individualism of Gil Evans. He was on the Charles Mingus album, Let My Children Hear Music. He was on a lot of Thelonious Monk albums. He was on John Coltrane's Africa Brass. Remember, this was kind of a, an expansive period for jazz, and uh, people were looking for new textures, new sonic qualities, and players like Julius, who were versed in both classical and jazz music, uh, you know, were hot during this era. So, um, yeah. He also rose to prominence a little bit later in the 60s, quite famously with um, Quincy Jones and Quincy Jones's ensembles. He was on the Quincy Jones uh, Birth of the Big Band album. He was on Big Band Bossa Nova, all that stuff. And Matt, you know, I don't know if you have French horn is a very, very difficult instrument to play, a very difficult brass instrument. Um, just to put it in a little perspective, you know, for, for comparison, the trumpet, standard trumpet, when mm -hmm. uncoiled, is a little over four feet of brass tubing. That's French a lot horn, of tubing. it's a lot of tubing, but check this out. French corn, if you uncoil all that, it's about 12 to 13 feet of brass tubing. So it makes it incredibly hard to, you know, slot notes efficiently to it's, it's just, you got to be a super a proficient technician to play this thing um and a lot of jazz greats did i mean gunther schuler you know who's kind of credited with popularizing third stream music was a french horn player and there's some really incredible french horn players to do ken wiley is another guy who's still holding it down playing jazz french horn and uh yeah so that's number five on my list julius watkins and his jazz french horn We've got an audience submission. Before we get to yours, we've got an audience submission from Mark Sutton letting us know uh, Bernard McKinney on Euphonium, on Ready for Freddy. Yes, sir. And let's see. Joyce Gaslow saying Paul McCandless, oboe, English horn, bass clarinet. Yes, Joyce, you're absolutely right. Um, she's also said uh, David Amram, Ralph Towner, jazz French horn. But in my opinion, the king of jazz French horn, Mr. Julius Watkins. All right, Matt, I pass it off to you. Which unconventional well, instruments is com coming in at number four? Uh, you know, uh, as you said, I went down the route of just really unusual instruments and uh, instruments played by instrumentalists who didn't make these instruments the primary ones. And uh, Pat Metheny, you know, we all know and love him. He's an absolute guitar master and oh, yeah. we love him for it. Uh, we all know that he also pioneered guitar synth. He's got a legendary guitar synth tone, but that's not all he pioneered. Actually, you know, he also pioneered a beautifully odd looking guitar named the Picasso guitar with a K. <laughs> yes, Look at that is. thing. I mean, talk about, talk about difficulty in holding an <laughs> instrument. How does he hold it? And how does he make it look so easy to hold it? I mean, you know, but let me tell you something a, li a little bit about this. Um, basically, he actually requested for this guitar to be built. And it was uh, Master Luthier, uh, I believe that's how you pronounce it, Linda Manzer or Manzer, uh, who uh, was to build a guitar. And the request uh, that he gave her was that it should have as many strings as possible. Well, that final number came to be 42 strings. Wow. And it also included a hexaphonic pickup to interface with Matheny's um, uh, Synclavier synthesizer, which is actually an, an early digital synthesizer. So just such a pioneer. And um, admittedly, the guitar never really caught on because look at it. But it does look awkward. It, it looks a little awkward to hold, like I said. Um, though geometrically, it's shaped in such a way that when Matheny uh, looks down, he's actually able to see all of the strings. And anyways, there are videos of him playing the guitar. And it's actually fascinating in itself to just see him look at it, look, just look at him play it. And he also used it on a couple of recordings, most notably on his ninth album with the Pat Metheny group, Imaginary Day, where he performs the Picasso guitar, Picasso with a K, on track three, Into the Dream. I love uh, the, the way it looks, and it really does look like an invention from Pablo Picasso himself. Wouldn't you agree, Brian? Totally Picasso-esque. And yeah. Uh, yeah, Pat Metheny, any number of instruments you could have done here, including yeah, his uh, orchestrion project. You know, he put out that whole album with his orchestrion. And uh, yeah, I'm glad we're kind of taking two different tacks here uh, because uh, in your group, you kind of also included people like Joe Lovano, 
who plays just a number of, you know, again, unconventional instruments um, in addition to his saxophone. So, uh, yeah. Oh, yes. We've definitely got some spoiler alerts coming ahead. But uh, Karen, yes, Pat <laughs> Metheny's instruments, any one, really, except for his conventional guitar, you could point to any number of them. But anyway, we shall move along. We're going to stick with the strings, though, uh, and go to number, where are we, three? Number three on the list now and this is someone everybody knows everybody loves it is mr bela fleck okay every you know from bela fleck and the fleck tones he's a 14 time grammy winner matt in almost as many different categories jazz country pop crossover classical world music the guy is truly a virtuoso and probably the best player on his instrument and that instrument is of course the banjo Okay, so Bela was born in New York City to classical music, classical music loving parents, uh, hence his name, Bela, named after Bela Bartok. Uh, but he fell in love with the banjo, the legend is, from listening to like the theme from Beverly Hillbillies and dueling banjos. Um, he did, so he studied a little bit of French horn in school, uh, so another French horn player on our list, but eventually dropped that to the wayside to focus on banjo. He just became obsessed with the banjo. And he is so technically proficient on this instrument that it is insane. He can play bebop. He can play heavy metal. He can play, uh, you know, flamenco. Uh, his stuff that he did with Chick Corea and Bobby McFerrin is incredible. Um, one of the most recent things he's done, though, that has been really cool for this instrument, Matt, as you know, is shown how much like jazz, you know, the banjo actually has roots in Africa. It developed uh, from instruments that originated in Africa. So he put out this documentary not too long ago, Throw Your Heart Down, uh, where he traveled to Africa to play with musicians um, on instruments that would you know, eventually become the banjo. Um, he's so multi-talented. And like I say, who else do you know can win Grammys in so many different categories? Uh, yeah, Bela Fleck, number three on my list for jazz banjo. Mm. And we've got a few more uh, honorable mentions in there. Yeah, yeah for sure. Rasan Roland Kirk with the Manzello and the Stretch. Yeah, Rasan Roland Kirk for a number of reasons. Um, yeah. To he's be fair, he was the first that came to my mind when you pitched this idea. But I totally. said, let's go. <laughs> 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 totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, again, if this list were 10 or 20, uh, all those people you mentioned, uh, Rasan, uh, you know, Django, Bernard McKinney, they'd all be on here, but we're limiting ourselves to five. Very, very tough. Um, oh, a reminder from our producer, Jeff, yes, that uh, this is our, of course, our fall 2020 issue, which uh, has already mailed to subscribers. So this thing is out in the world. This is our fall 2020 print and digital issue. It's all about the art of the album. So listening to albums, collecting albums, producing albums, if you love albums, real physical albums, holding them in your hand, reading the liner notes, taking out the sleeve, putting it on the record player, dropping that needle, this is the issue for you. Now, like I mentioned, it's already mailed to subscribers, but we convert all of the print material that appears in these print issues, so all the stories, articles, reviews, into web articles. You can read them online. You will need a digital subscription to read them, but fortunately, we're offering a special subscription rate right now for just 99 cents per month for three months. You can unlock unlimited digital access to the site, which means you could read all the articles in this, in this issue and previous issues, and we'll enroll you to receive a complimentary issue of our forthcoming quarterly print issue that's coming out in December. It is our winter 2020 issue, and it is all about jazz and film, jazz movies, jazz documentaries, great Hollywood scores, musicals. If you love jazz and mu movies, this is the issue for you. Uh, become a subscriber today, uh, get that unlimited digital access, and we'll enroll you to receive a complimentary print issue uh, come December when we mail win winter 2020. Mm. And I know you love jazz and movies. You are a movie buff, Matt, a movie I scholar. You're more than a buff. You're a yeah. scholar, a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> a gentleman, I, would, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> a scholar, not even. <laughs> I'm just a guy, you know, Brian. <laughs> just a guy. Very cool. Well, hey, you're the guy with the number two pick on our list so yeah. and you kind of went with a cool one for this because this is new this is brand new so yeah what instrument uh, yeah wh who'd you pick for number two here matt 
Well, all right. So I kind of, you know, I, 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 I shouldn't have picked this instrument, Brian, because I, I realized just now that I can't pronounce it. I mean, I'm going to give it a shot, you know, but uh, there's, a, there's a double J there. So it's kind of throwing me off a little bit. Anyways, look, this is a more modern instrument. And that's why I sort of picked it because, you know, we, we got to look to the future. And this is really a fascinating one. It's called the Harpeggi. Or at least that's how I'm choosing to pronounce it. If anyone that's knows the pronunciation, you know, you can write it down phonetically in the comments below. Great. Um, hey, so uh, this is a fascinating uh, instrument, and we can see Jacob Collier playing it there. It was developed in 2007, and I hope you can't hear the siren in the background. That's not an unusual instrument. That's just a pain in the you-know-what. <laughs> but uh, can you hear that? A wow. little bit, and that That's is number two and a half on our list of half. unconventional instruments in jazz. So anyways, uh, to, so the instrument was developed in 2007 by Tim Meeks, and it really claims to um, uh, bridge the gap between the guitar, the bass guitar, and the piano. It's an electric stringed uh, musical instrument, and it's primarily played with just as you can see from the image there with a two-handed tapping technique it's actually fascinating to see anybody play it it's it's great to look at and it looks very difficult to play to me i mean i don't know it, it probably requires a lot of patience to learn for sure but it does evoke that transcendental sound it sort of evokes exotic traditional instruments from Asia, but also to me, at least, I can hear a twang that reminds me of a slide guitar. So it's fascinating for several reasons as well as that. So among the musicians who seem to have picked it up quite well and reveled in its potential is multi-instrumental uh, multi multi instrumentalist Jacob Collier. Uh, in fact, his video performance, which he uploaded on his YouTube channel of Overjoyed by Stevie Wonder, is how I discovered this amazing instrument. And uh, since then, he has been using it more and more. He's been uploading more videos where he plays it. I'm, I haven't really looked into it as much, but it could even be part of the majestic wall of sound of his uh, latest album, Jesse, uh, Volume 2. And, uh, and also, he's been live streaming with it. Uh, what fascinates me about this instrument is that it is a relatively new one, so we may grow to see it more and more used in jazz, but also other music. And uh, I, from what I've heard, uh, I, I would love to hear more of it. It's a, it's a really great instrument. It has a really unique sound. I'm fascinated, and that's why I decided to pick it. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Jacob Collier is a brilliant multi-instrumentalist uh, from England who, if it makes a sound, uh, Jacob Collier could probably play it and make yeah. it groove. <laughs> uh, he's famous for these, uh, you know, looped performances where he'll play the piano, loop himself playing piano, play bass, loop himself playing bass, and just layer everything till it's just like this gorgeous genre exploding song. Uh, he's becoming quite prop popular. We profiled him a few issues ago when we were talking about the London scene and the rising stars there. And uh, yeah, it, it it comes as no shock to me that he is becoming a maestro of the harpeggi or harpeggi, however yeah. you want to say it. <laughs> Go with that. <laughs> anyway, I like it, Matt. And that brings us to number one on the list. You graciously gave me the number one slot. And uh, a few of you in the comments were kind of reading my mind uh, here. But, I mean, for me, there is no more unconventional instrumentalist in jazz than my man, Rufus Harley, playing jazz, <laughs> yeah. playing jazz, bagpipes um rufus harley is just the coolest cat he is he so he was a sax player i mean he was a reed player uh from the philadelphia scene you know playing tenor playing alto playing you know c melody sax um and doing a lot of jazz and blues funk you know it was philadelphia he was inspired to pick up the bagpipes so the story goes after seeing the funeral uh procession for jfk on TV, he was just really kind of moved by these instruments. Um, and so he got a pair from like a, a New York pawn shop and uh, just started playing it because he had this background in jazz and blues. He naturally wanted to start playing this stuff on the bagpipes. Um, so as, as legend goes, you know, he'd be practicing all night bagpipes in his apartment and the neighbors oh. would call the cops, you know, to file a noise complaint. And so the cops would come, they'd be knocking on all the doors, they'd knock on the apartment that got the complaint, Rufus's door, and he'd open the door and they'd say, 
I'm sorry, are bagpipes coming for you? And Rufus would say, do I look like the kind of guy that would be playing bagpipes, sir? And <laughs> they'd move along. Uh, and so he never got in trouble for it. But he became this amazing, prolific bagpipe player. Um, starting in the 60s, he went on to record a bunch of leader records, leader bagpipe records for Atlantic um, wow. under the direction of this producer, Joel Dorn, who loved Rufus. Um, and bagpipes are a tough instrument man because you know you fill the bag with air and you squeeze it so you kind of got this continue the this the air comes out of all the pipes you can't really stop the air once it's coming out so you got this continuous drone note mm. and rufus had to work that into jazz music which as you know is constantly <laughs> shifting is constantly changing uh but he found a way to do it he found a way to do it he was known as this really great blues bagpipe player and look, he would go on to do his thing until like the 2000s. Um, he died in 2006, but he appeared with John Coltrane, with Dexter Gordon. He was even on the album Do You Want More by The Roots, doing a little hip-hop bagpipe there with The Roots. But I feel like you cannot talk about unconventional jazz instruments without mentioning Mr. Rufus Harley. So that goes to number one. Now, I did have some honorable mentions here as well. Um, you know, I wanted to shout out who do we got? Jen Shu, who plays a number of, uh, uh, there she is of traditional Taiwanese instruments. Mm. Um, and she's incredible. Um, and she can make all, make all of them swing. And again, these instruments were not designed to play jazz changes. And yet here she is laying it down. Um, I also gave an honorable mention to Paul Hansen who plays jazz oboe. I don't know if we have a picture of him. There he is. And jazz oboe is very, if you've never, hear, if you've never heard it, it sounds almost like um, like a synthesizer, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because jazz, uh, the oboe has that, I'm sorry, bassoon has that very kind of reedy sound, uh, but it's deep, it's resonant. So hearing him sounds like Herbie playing synthesizer solos. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the list. Matt, uh, thanks for joining me as we run down these. Hey, can I give you an honorable mention? Of course, bring it on. And again, people in, in the comments section, we <laughs> welcome honorable mentions from you as well. Yes, Matt. Yeah, yeah, I, I really would love to see, hear some uh, honorable mentions from the people watching. It's a fascinating conversation that we're having, actually. Um, I, hey, I was thinking, you know, uh, Fred Astaire, when he did the tap dancing to some of the music of his films, he was an oh, actually yeah. he was actually an exceptional drummer too. But when you hear uh, some of the songs or the musicals and his dancing, you know, the the sound of his shoes, they become an instrument in fact uh, within the music itself. And uh, I guess there's no album of of that highlighting that. Perhaps there is. Maybe I should look into it. But uh, that's a percussive instrument, and it's kind of a an odd one, though. It's possibly not considered as such, but uh, I would consider it as such. Totally. And I'm, I was thinking slide trum, tr slide trumpet, you know, that Wycliffe Gordon plays, maybe some yeah. valve trombone by Bob Brookmeyer or the Firebird thing that Maynard Ferguson plays. Again, a lot of unconventional instruments out there, but that term unconventional, you know, like we say, this is jazz. Uh, all musicians are, all instruments are part of the jazz. Everything's family, allowed. Really. There's no such thing as, as convention. But hey, we hope you enjoyed the list nonetheless. Uh, if you like this content, please follow us on Facebook. Uh, sign up for our newsletter on jazzes.com. Uh, like us on YouTube. Hit that notification bell so that you know whenever we're going live. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining me. It's been uh, a pleasure. Italy, no less. As my daughter bangs away on a very conventional instrument in the living room, that would be our stand-up piano. That is my mm. cue to go, everyone. <laughs> I will see you later. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.